I am Daniel Lukies and welcome to Book 101 Review uh, And today, of course, m- our Safa Sunday uh, With Miss Safa Bernal Hello everybody, how are you doing today? I hope everything is going well, or you have a little bit of respite in which to listen to Book 101 and enjoy some poetry today. Yes, in celebration of Poetry Month, Miss Safa Bernal and I, we talk about poetry for the whole month. So Miss Bernal, what will be our topic for today? We're going to talk poetry. We are going to talk, you know, a little bit of the history of poetry and then what it can be, what it can do. And we're going to look at some science fiction based and sort of fantasy based poetry today with uh, my book, Usurper Kings. Yes. Is Usurper Kings right there? And then I also have A Warning Light Calling by Peter Vestergaard and The Drake Equation by Brad Hogue. I'd love to talk about all three of these books. I have had the privilege of knowing uh, Peter Bestergaard and Brad Hogue, even just a little bit, in the poetry sphere. And we're all published by the same place, House of Hallows. And so totally excited to talk about this today. I'm looking forward to it. What yes, a- definitely. So, Ms. Bernal, uh, what is the purpose of using meter in poetry? Uh, the first reason we use meter and we have you know whether it's iambic pentameter or we have any form of meter is just the fact that poetry was usually spoken you know yes we have written poetry you know some of the um written poetry that we have dates back to you know we've got the epic of Gilgamesh, which is you know thousands of years old over three thousand years old you've got uh, poetry that was written specifically for you know kind of an upper class but for the most part poetry was something that came from oral storytelling and it came from you know the skulls of you know scandinavian ilk you know it came from these people that were putting it to music like sappho you know sappho the poet um musician from um lesbos you know in ancient greece which was one of the most famous poets of her time and subsequent times as well you know you have people talking still about her in the roman empire hundreds of years after she had passed you know talking about this lyricist really you know you have that kind of lyrical flow to poetry because most poetry is meant to be performed. It's meant to be heard. Yes. To be heard, people. So what can you use as imagery to enhance the theme of a poem? Anything that people can connect to. I say it this way because there's kind of two ways to approach it. One is to connect something that has, you know, to your knowledge, never been connected. Now, there is nothing new under the sun for every yeah. kind of connection that one person makes. Oh, I'm going to do this about cactus people. They're, they're, they're beings made of cactuses and they're going about in a fantasy world. It's like, okay, so have you ever played the Final Fantasy series of video games with cactars? No? Okay. Just to let you know, it's happened before. That doesn't mean that we can't be original, but most things in uh, the arts, You know, after thousands of years of us being on this incredible planet, there have been times where certain images come to our heads because they are part of that sort of cultural subconscious, that zeitgeist. So on one hand, being original is awesome and you can always try and connect things to something new. You can try and connect your poetry to a certain theme. Um, But the farther you go away from known images and what we would call on the negative side cliché, the more you have to sort of prime the reader to understand what you're talking about. So going back to that, you know, sort of cactus person thing, if you're not familiar with the cactars in the Final Fantasy series, then somebody mentioning this sort of right angled hopping cactus that's, you know, doing a bunch of damage than running away. Uh, if you don't know of that image, that's just going to be very bizarre. 
But for the people who are in the know, they're going to be like, ah, oh my goodness, brilliant. Love it. Can't believe you made that, you know, you likened a cat to this. This is awesome. You know, it's, it's enlightened. It's beautiful. I love it. Um, or on the other side, they'd be like, oh, really? <laughs> the things from the video game? Are you serious? Like, oh, you know, you risk that kind of bound. But the first thing you need to ask yourself when it comes to your poetry is who is your audience? Who are you writing this for? Are you writing this for yourself and your friends? Are you writing this for the world at large? Are you writing this for a specific culture or a specific religious group or a specific demographic? You know, who are you writing this for? And then what sort of imagery will they understand? You know, this is part of the ideal reader, this, this idea of the ideal reader, somebody who will get all of your illusions, somebody who will understand all of your themes, somebody who's in the know on a certain realm of knowledge that you're using that somebody outside of that realm of knowledge might not have. And so when you're creating these themes, when you're creating these images and these sort of illusions and metaphors, uh, you really do need to see who can connect to it and who will look at it in a completely different fashion. And you do need to be aware of that. Because if you're thinking that, oh, somebody will listen to this, you know, this poem, and they will obviously see that, like, the famous kind of example would be uh, William Carlos Williams, the Red Wheelbarrow, you know, there's what basically, there's a poem about a red wheelbarrow beside a bunch of clucking chickens. That's the poem. It is quite famously just a poetic Polaroid picture of a red wheelbarrow beside some chickens. That's all it is. It's just an image written down. But if you just give a whole, and we did this when I was in university, we gave the entire class this one poem and about 10, 15 minutes to just think about what this poem stands for, what it means. And everyone came back with these like, oh, this clearly this is about communism and the chickens are the common man. And then you've got this and, you know, you've got all of these different allusions that people were trying to make. Well, the color red means passion. So maybe it's about, you know, and they're just trying to, you know, break down all of the hidden metaphors within this poem. And I just sat there and I, I just looked up at my professor and was like, did, because I was very, you know, I was, yeah, this is first year university. This is my first English class. I was a little precocious, you know. I was like, dude, is this just about a wheelbarrow besides some chickens? <laughs> and the prof was like, yes. <laughs> She's like, yes, it is. That's all it is. And people were offended. They were like, no, it has to be about something more. But with poetry, people always look for something more. For the most part, they are looking to dig in and find some form of heteroglossic layer upon layer upon layer meaning to your work. And if it's not there, then that poetry is going to fall very flat. So you need to be aware of kind of not everybody because you can't control who's necessarily going to read your work unless you just hand it to one person and say, there you go. Um, but you should be aware of the sort of illusions that could be made from certain images within your culture and within some of the other cultures around um, before you kind of put that poem in stone and before that image is chosen. Um, because it's so fun once you start ping-ponging between different images and different metaphors and illusions to try and figure out, you know, what will people make of this? And I think that's half the fun. Yes. But definitely fun, fun, fun. So, Miss Bernal, can you recite a poem that signifies of what we are talking about? I absolutely can. I am going to go with one of Brad Hogue's poems. Um, this is from his collection, uh, The Drake Equation. It was just released by House of Hallows. Where's the poem that I want to? Aha, here we go. Martian days. Steam rises off seas surrounding the deserted city. Water too salty to drink. The ocean no longer visible from rooftops. Sharp spires of rock jutting above dunes of white gypsum suffused by rusting soil. Bands of color marking the ages of our past. Green muds, black shales, separating lavender sands, pink cobble, orange clays. Strata all ultimately overlaid with red. 
Mm. This is Martian <laughs> Days from... Powerful poem. <laughs> I love it. It's sci-fi. It's also very true to science. Now, uh, Brad Hoke is a science educator. You know, he is somebody who's incredibly intelligent with science. And so he goes into a lot of, you know, like <laughs> space travel and planetary science. And it's called the Drake Equation for a reason, because it's bringing on that connotation of, you know, the equation to see how much intelligent life there is in the universe. Uh, so with this one, you know, for those in the know of what Mars is like, they're like, oh, yeah, everything's overlaid with red. Everything's this, everything's that. But for the scientists among us who are interested in all things astral, who are interested in the planets in our solar system, they will know that a lot of those images of the quote unquote red planet were photo manipulated. They were color timed. So the Martian atmosphere, which in a lot of photos looks really yellow and orange and red, is actually not <laughs> you know it's closer to the cool tones it's closer to those blues and and some of the other uh colors and so you've got you know lavender sands pink cobbles and orange clays but it's overlaid with that sense of red even though mars itself like you know we won't really know until some of us are on the planet but the images that we get back from various rovers and various research projects show that it's not necessarily as red as we see in all things yet at the same time you got that rusting soil you know that sort of iron oxide the oxides that kind of make it a little bit of red in places and different things like that and so if you are one of those people who are in the know then this poem has another layer to it about the different research that we've been doing on the constitution of various atmospheric uh, things and soil-based geological things on mars so for somebody that just wants to read it it's like okay We've got a brand new land. It is a brand new planet. We are, you know, living on Mars now. There is this group of people living on Mars and you can't drink the water and the ocean is no longer visible from the rooftops. You know, society has grown up to a specific point in time. We are in this fantasy of living in a Martian society with skyscraping buildings that cover the ocean from our view. And yet it still brings us back to that strata all ultimately overlaid by red which is bringing us right back again to our classical idea of mars and i love that i love how brad hope does that in his work um ah, it's so fun <laughs> Congratulations, Mr. Brad Hook. Amazing poem. But before we go on, Ms. Bernal, I want to shout out my our uh, listeners in Spain. Muchas gracias, Spain, because in Andalusia, we got 41% audience share. Catalonia, Madrid, Valencia, Navarre, Galicia, Castilla de Leon, Aragon, Basque County, Balearic Islands, Extremadura, Mauritius, Canary Islands, and a lot more. Thank you, Spain, for supporting this podcast because this podcast is created in power. Writers, others, all over the world, like Miss Safa Bernal. So, Miss Bernal, what to rhyme verse? You get to tailor it to your own speech patterns, your own sort of patterns of thought a little bit more. I do love structure in my poetry. I do love kind of getting into sonnets and haiku and various, you know, scaldic poetry too. I've been getting a lot more into scaldic poetry, uh, which is kind of <laughs> a lot more complicated. <laughs> it's really diff it's it's quite complicated. Um, but as somebody of Scandinavian descent, I wanted to kind of dive back into sort of traditional views on poetry and uh, various views on scaldic arts. Uh, but free verse, really, you know, it's in the name. It's about freedom, but it's also about kind of making it your own. And you can get the cadence of somebody and their speech patterns from free verse in a way that you can't in something that's very metered with lots of consistent rhyme. And I love that. I love being able to see the personality of the poet on the page when it comes to free verse in a way that you don't necessarily get the same. You still get the personality. You still get that sense of life and that sense of identity in poems with meter and rhyme. Uh, 
but free verse does it in a much more distilled fashion, I would say. Yes. So can we uh, read some of your free verse poem? Look here. <clears throat> you know what? I'm going to read Time Masters and the Cogs. Time Masters and the Cogs comes from my, my book, Usurper Kings. It's this one right here. It's in Act 3 of five acts in the book, and it's more where I release myself from a lot of different meters and rhymes and start doing more free verse as a way to show, you know, the progression of society and the progression of culture over time. Time Masters and the Cogs. Lotus Eaters, Mystics, and Christ Mass Chefs. Begat Cogs, Wires, and Sprockets. Itemized time and gave God clockworks, watchmaker Christ who came later, rewound the mechanism for another thousand years. Nurses like Florence dedicated to caring for whole men, dirtily, medical brothels dancing through educated history, dandy while we keep our placid places. Don't mention the sweeping curves of her hips to the history books cleansed by Victorian attitudes. She wrote from her bedside years after the Crimean. Florence took to pen and struggled for reform, for bleached cleans and boiled linens. Masters conquered time's rigid benevolence, godliness, the power of the cog's prayer. I ate medieval superstitions wholesale while serfs in Russia and Denmark ate rye and feasted on fish while Lent restrained their roiling crops of meat. Mastery of human self arose, and dainty ladies' spindles swapped for paged books, spread knowledge to masses who were empty. Printing presses spanned gaps to the learned, giving churchmen competition on Latin grounds, chiseled the written word in Germanic, Romantic, Cyrillic. Who needed the folks who imprisoned Galileo and promised retribution lest he recant the imperfection of the spheres seen through lenses of human design? Dull-eared priests clung to superstitions as if Christ needed the Earth-centric solar system to be born in Bethlehem, who cursed scientific rebellion as if God required blind obedience to Grecian hypotheses and Aristotelian mechanics. Time masters whispered and prayed forgiveness for the talents God had dispersed into their clockwork brains. Discover my spheres, the complexity of my atomic particles, created so you too would be created. Praise me. High in ninth heaven, surrounded by holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, God spurred the scientists on. Discover me. The time masters pushed wax in their ears, drowned God's symphony out in mechanics as women began to rub their sleepy eyes and learn fabric mills, cotton gins, spelling bees. We'll listen, said the suffragettes, who heard God speak, since the men were too busy to hear it. Bravo, Miss Bernal! <laughs> Amazing <laughs> poem. So, what inspired you to write a poem? So, this was me, a couple of things, looking at the feminine through time. You know, that was the, the point of Usurper Kings. The whole collection is an inspection in the feminine over a period of, of thousands of years, over a period of, you know, centuries upon centuries. And when I got to Time Masters and the Cogs, I wanted to take on the Enlightenment. I wanted to take on that switch in Eurocentric thinking, going from, you know, the church saying, oh, no, obviously the earth is in the center of the universe and <laughs> all that kind of thing to, well, no, it's not. And this idea that, you know, a creator doesn't need us to think, you know, negative things about science you know a creator if a creator exists doesn't need that the creator should be found and discovered through scientific discoveries and so i wanted to do that on one side and then the other side i remembered my um my mom when she put herself through university when my brother and i were kids you know it it was just uh, her us and my grandparents and she did a paper on the history of nursing and she looked up Florence Nightingale. She was like, oh, Florence Nightingale. Yeah, you know, the Crimean War, all these things. You know, this is this will be great. And then she looked into it. And she looked into what Florence Nightingale and several nurses were actually doing in that time period. Things that Florence Nightingale ended up writing about later when after the Crimean War had passed, she was a little bit more broken as a person. 
and spent her life trying to, you know, advocate for cleanliness in various medical places. And so I had this kind of paper that my mom had written for an academic project in my head. And then I also had this idea of what was happening during that time period, you know, what was happening at the tail end of the Enlightenment coming into the modern age. What were people doing? What were people thinking? And I had to very cheekily add the suffragettes because that kind of, you know, also corresponds with the same time period a little bit. There's a bit of crossover there. And so this idea that if everyone else was kind of pushing forward and leaving all of the past behind, there is still somebody, there is still some force on the planet who will remember and who will bring that stuff, what is healthy back and let the rest of it die. Yes, very well said, Ms. Bernard. So what do you think poetry in our generations to generations to come? Ooh. What will be the future? I think eventually we will reach a point where people are getting too obtuse. You know, I've seen a sort of track of people will become a little too niche. I think there will be poets who you know, kind of in a, in, we see this a little bit with, you know, some of the work of the last century, you know, the futurists going, Hey, well, you still need to know the classics in order to know how to write something that's not the classics, uh, which I believe is very true. And that's something that I, I kind of bank on. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think there will come a point where people are so sort of subcultured in cloisters where poetry won't be able to communicate universally necessarily and i think that we need to watch that and we need to kind of be like uh, uh, no let's pull back just a little bit you know pull back just a little bit because eventually if you experiment widely enough if you push an experiment of poetry further enough it becomes un indistinguishable it becomes unapproachable it becomes so cerebral within one tiny little sub frame of mind that very few people will be able to understand what's going on uh, other than just nodding and going, oh, yeah, mm -hmm, oh, mm -hmm, uh huh, yeah. <laughs> you know, the same way that right now we see in a lot of art museums and modern art where people are going, oh, yes, no, yeah, you know, I, I took, you know, art history in, in university. This is nothing like it. I don't know what's going on. And they need to be kind of trained in, in a new way, in a new form of interpretation. Um, but I also think that within that sort of push towards experimentation to the point of, you know, obfuscation, we're also going to get a whole group of poets who realize that having distinct form is a blessing. That sometimes having an idea that you need this many rhyme schemes, you need this many stanzas, you need this many words, you need this many, you know, breaks and pushes per line it's going to bring us back to that sense that having a few boundaries is actually very freeing yes definitely it really is boundaries boundaries people so miss bernal can you please invite our listeners to support all your books most especially your poetry book Hello, everybody. I hope you're enjoying our show today. I love coming on Book 101 with you. It's always a lot of fun. Uh, you can read my books like Usurper Kings, also like Char and Ash yes. and Son of Abel mm. and Macabre and Monstrous and Neon Lieben. You can view them uh, in any bookstore, you know, basically all the bookstores that are around. Um, all you need to do is, um, all you need to do is make sure that uh, if they're not in the bookstore right then, you get the uh, bookstore owner to bring them in, or you can go online at sapapernell.com. You can also go online in places like Barnes and Nobles, Amazon, Black Bond Books, Chapters Indigo, <laughs> basically all the big ones, Saxo in Europe, um, also Waterstones in Europe as well, in the UK. Uh, my books are available basically everywhere. They may need to be brought in or you can purchase them online, but I would super appreciate 
uh, if you purchase some of my books. And if that's just not in the cards for you right now, if you're like, yeah, but then, hmm, that's a lot more books right now and things are getting a little tight, then I hope you go to your local public library, uh, barring that you have one in your region of the world, and please request them to bring my books in. Uh, the local public library system is such an amazing system that we should all support, and it does support authors like myself, especially here in Canada, if our books are in those libraries. So please, if you are not in a position to financially uh, be able to press that buy button, uh, please go to your library and request the book so you can still read my work and so my books can be read by as much of the community as want to read emotionally grounded, character-driven works of cyberpunk and mythpunk. Yes, definitely, people. Let's support Miss Safa Bernal. As I said, if you support her, more, 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 more books to come. Is there will be another poetry book, Miss Bernal? I am currently working on another poetry book. Mm -hmm. I have a title, but that's not you yet. Know, but we're looking forward. There in the background. Yeah, we're looking forward for Ginun Gagap. <laughs> oh yes, Ginun Gagap is going to be a lot of fun. That is part of the Judge of Mystic saga, which is, uh, you know, I say myth punk. That's basically a, a subgenre of like urban fantasy, contemporary fantasy, which is looking at mythology and folklore in a punkish sort of way. Uh, something that I do quite frequently in my work, <laughs> even in my works of poetry. Uh, so Ginun Gagap is the uh, is one of the books in this series, and it's coming out in a short order of time it's coming out this year so i'm so excited for it uh and then once it's out then i get to take a deep breath have a little sleep <laughs> start <laughs> meeting people in book signings and i get to continue working on my second book of poetry uh which will uh i'll have more details you can join my substack at userworkings.substack.com in order to find out the latest greatest and best news of my creative process uh my workshops where i teach people how to write and how to edit their work and uh also i'll be giving news about when my next poetry collection is coming yes 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 and promote your podcast miss bernal so i am the member of uh, one of three of we aren't dead yet which is a podcast available everywhere. If you are currently listening to Book 101 Review, then you can currently also listen to We Aren't Dead Yet, otherwise known as Wadi. We Aren't Dead Yet is a podcast based on literature and tabletop role-playing games. So we do a little bit of nerd culture. We do a lot of science fiction, a lot of fantasy. And it is the three of us, myself, Safa Brunel, uh, Emily Armstrong, who is an internationally awarded world builder and also the creator of Quest and Quarrels, Culinary Punk, and um, Elder Space, and also K.S. Bischoff, uh, who I like to call K.S., and she is the author of the Pangorio setting, also the game Meaty Bones, and she is also just an incredible, incredible uh, game master with over 30 years of experience. So it's a lot of fun. We get into a lot of things about literature, movies, games, and uh, our own work, which you can read. Da, 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 da. in macabre monsters monster yes <laughs> all three of us are in it <laughs> yes let's support me suffer burnell people but before we go on i want to plug my online business people online business food 101 merchandise from derived from my food 101 podcast if you are looking for any kind of products you can have it on my Food 101 merchandise like pet hoodie, jigsaw puzzle, ceramic, ceramic ornament, face towel, kids puzzle, and a lot more. People, Food 101 merchandise available on Etsy and Shopify. I will um, uh, include the link below this episode. So please do support Food 101 merchandise. So, Miss Bernal. Good. <laughs> thank you. And Ms. Bernal, thank you for your time. And thank you for having me on. It's always a delight and a pleasure. More to come, people. See you soon.